Okay, we're live. Today is Sunday, July 27th, 2014, and um, I guess it's Comic-Con weekend. What are you guys, uh, let's see, Joe and, hey, Olivia. Hey. Hi, Olivia. Joe and Olivia, we're talking about, when's that comic coming out you guys were talking about? It's not Lovecraftian, but it was I think they said October. What is it again? Justice Incorporated. Yep. There'll be a Doc Savage Shadow of Envy team up by Michael Uslan. I think um, the Shadow over Innsmouth is supposed to come out this week. Yeah, uh, it's supposed to come one? out in August. Someone sent me a note. I'll have to check it out for myself, so this is not my official thoughts on the matter, but someone sent me a note out of the blue and goes, don't, bar don't bother with Shadow over Innsmouth. It's terrible. You know the shadow story. Looking likely. Okay. Well. Well, I'll have to get it just as a completist. Well, it may be. It may be fine. You know, it's subjective. Well, well, I mean, I'm just saying, it's both a shadow one and a Lovecraft fan. I've got to get, get that one at least. Yeah. I don't generally. I haven't been generally buying the the dynamite uh, shadow stories. I've I've bought a few of them in uh, trade paperback and. They were okay. I wasn't, you know, going to go crazy and collect them all. Yeah. Also, um, I've been watching Matt Wagner's working on something called Grendel versus the Shadow. Hmm. And I'm a big Grendel Matt Wagner fan, so. Oh yeah, all right, Grendel. Okay, took me a second. Oh, yeah, I, I would like Grendel, to... the comic book character. Yeah, yeah no, I got, I, I got it. If you know, it was. It was Somebody had my brain on two-second delay or something. <laughs> well, you say Grendel, and I go to Grendel Grendel. I didn't go to hey. the comic book. You know, there was no Grendel comic book when I was a kid, but there was Grendel, so... Did you ever read the book by John Gardner on Grendel? Mm -mm. It was Beowulf from the Monster's Viewpoint. Excellent book. Um, I would like to thank the people that um, that donated to my computer fund. Hopefully, this will be the last day that I'm doing these shows on this uh, this computer. It's a good it's a good little laptop, but it's just not working anymore. It's freezing up all the time, and and so uh, appreciate everybody that donated. Thank you very much. Um, I, as most of you know, I just moved, so I'm putting books away. I was just telling you guys this. And uh, came, it reminded me of an interesting book, um, To Sleep Perchance to Nightmare, um, 30 Terrifying Tales. Uh, I believe it came out in, yeah, 1993. Um, I bought it six or seven years ago in a used bookstore. Um, there's, and I was just rereading it last couple of days because um, it's a great collection, horror collection. Uh, with the nightmare theme, of course, and it reminded me that there's there's several uh, mythos or and or Lovecraftian stories in here, which Rick and Joe and I were just talking about. It's I definitely recommend picking it up on Amazon. You can probably get it for a, a buck or two, I bet. Um, it's got the Black Stone by Robert E. Howard. Um, Rick, you mentioned The Lady in Grey by Donald Wandry. Am I saying his name right? Yes, he's saying it right. Yep. Okay. And then the one one that I I enjoyed almost everything in here, but I really enjoyed uh, The Dreams of Albert Moreland by Fritz Lieber. Yes, that's, that's more Lovecraftian than Mythos, but it's an excellent story. Yeah. Yeah. Are you guys familiar with this book or any of those stories I mentioned? Yeah, I, I've... I've read that book some time ago, and it's somewhere on my shelf. Yeah, it's. I recommend it for anyone that doesn't have it on their shelf. Um, I recommend picking it up. The Dreams of Albert Morland is 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 set in the autumn of 1939, and it's basically about these two guys that are unemployed. One of them plays chess at the uh, at some game place um, for 25 cents a game, and and he's been having this dream every night about this. It's not chess, but it's infinitely more complicated and scary. 
and he starts to get this feeling that this game he's playing in his dreams is is really important. I won't say any more than that, but um, it was pretty interesting. The whole book's That's pretty interesting. Fritz Lieber? Yes. Yeah. Fritz Lieber had an interesting chest. Yep. Um, a lot of his characters play chess, and uh, one of the short stories I read when I was a kid, I remember uh, it was in his collection, A Pale of Air. It was called The 64 Square Madhouse, about um, like one of the first computers playing in a chess tournament. Hmm. Some old master who wasn't very good and hooked up with a young girl. Um, and it was just really pretty entertaining. Um, so it's kind of interesting that he, he, was, he wrote several stories dealing with the game. I didn't know that. I'll have to pick that up. By the way, the title, The Pale of Error, is a really good science fiction story itself um, that he yeah, wrote. Well. It, was, um, it was dramatized on X-1 in the 40s. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you heard that, Livia? Yeah, I do. I have listened to all of X-1, although <laughs> it's been so long since I've gone through the whole the whole, you know, list that, but yes, I do remember. I do remember that. Yeah. Well, a, a Pale of Air is not Lovecraftian, but it's one that stuck with me since I heard it when I was a kid, and it's basically about, uh, yeah, I guess it is sort of Lovecraftian in a way, but basically this dark star comes through the solar system or this huge planet, something similar, and wrestles the Earth away out of the solar system, pulls it out of the solar system. So Earth's not circling the sun anymore. So everything freezes, including the oxygen itself. And this family survives, and they think they're the last family on Earth. And basically to breathe, they have to go outside and get pails of oxygen and put it on the fire and burn it, which is where the name comes from. So, um, yeah, that's a collection, Matt, Pale of Air. That's the title. Yeah. This was like, gosh, in the 1970s when I was first dabbling in science fiction. Yeah. It had, um, it, it was like one of the first things I read by Lieber that had nothing to do with Fafford and the Grey Mouser. Um, he had this uh, series going on where there were the uh, spiders versus the uh, snakes. Yeah, <laughs> big time. The big time. Yeah, that was it. Um, this was a story, I think, related to that scenario, and uh, they actually dealt with chess in that game, too, in that book story, too. The because spiders and the snakes were uh, t two warring factions that were using time travel, right? Yeah, exactly. We never found out exactly what they were, how they originated through all these... This is so long. Speculation, ago. like they might be some Nazi or some leftover Nazis, and they might be something else. Yeah, I, um, I barely remember it. Brett on the message board just asked about this one again. To uh, to sleep, perchance to nightmare. Editors are Robert Weinberg, Martin Greenberg, and Stefan R. I'm not even going to attempt that last He's name. Bankowitz. Yes, thank you. Um, so. Yeah. And then, then uh, Robin Spriggs sent me this. Just came in the mail. I guess this is his new book. It is. It's bloody wonderful. Oh, have you read it, Joe? Yeah, I I, I had the art several years ago. Oh yeah. And I've had that for a couple of months. Um, because originally that double feature press thing was going to be, it was going to be like an old ace book. So the Osmond Droom stuff was going to be one half of the book and then you were going to flip it over and I was going to be the other half of the book. Oh, okay. But unfortunately that didn't come about even though Rob and I were really looking forward to sharing covers together. Um... So I, I've been I, I've been reading Osmond Droom stuff for quite a few years now. Everybody, everybody who liked um, 
the last one. I should be able to pull it out fairly easy. Or with my luck, I won't be. I Diary, Diary yeah. of uh, Gentleman Diabolus for all the fans of this, and I know there were quite a few. Um, Osmond Droom is going to really blow your mind. Um, How do you spell that last name? E R O O M. Oh. E R O O M. It's on Amazon. And I don't know that it's available to order yet. Yeah, it's, there's six left in stock. Oh, okay. All right. Five. Read Four. all you want. They'll make more. What what sort of character is Osmond Drew? Is he an occult detective or? Uh... No, I'm not saying what he is. Okay. <laughs> uh, I don't I don't want to give away anything. Um, okay, that's fine. If it's better not knowing, I don't want to. Know. Who who well, wrote it? It's, it's, it's Robin Spriggs. Robin Spriggs. S P R I G G S. Um. It starts off like this. I'll read the first paragraph, and then I'll stop. In his hometown of Withershin, Georgia, Osmond Droom was not well-liked. He was not hated exactly, at least not at first. Hatred is a, is a decidedly, decidedly sorry, unchristian emotion, and the good folk of Withershin would have been reluctant to harbor it even for the vilest of souls. But Christian values notwithstanding, Osmond Droom, though far from vile, was equally far far from loved. And the girls liked him too, apparently. He looked <laughs> really interesting. No, it goes on to say that. <laughs> no, although I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> no, I've never read any of Robin's work before other than the story of his that I published. Well, Robin was in a season in Carcosa and he was in Grim oh, right. Scribes. And, right, right, you know, I forgot. Uh, uh, I... I, I adore Robin's work. I think it's great. And one of the things with Diary of a Gentleman Diabolist is is the pieces, most of the pieces in here are, here's one that's a quarter page, whole page, half page. Um, everything in, in this is a page, give or take. And with Osmond Drew, Drew Robin starts to stretch out, and I really love it when Robin stretches out. That's not to say that Osmond Droom doesn't have some awfully short text like Gentleman Diabolist did, because it does, but there's a lot more of Robin um, stretching out. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's not, it's not, it's not an, it's, it's different, and different is good. This looks really great. I, I just got it, so I haven't had a chance to read it yet. But I can already tell I'm going to like it from the little bit I've scanned of it. So. And Robin's work has been praised by Laird. It's been praised by Fred Chapel. You know, magazines like Cemetery Dance. There's just not enough of it. That's a problem with some of these really brilliant writers. There's just not enough. <coughs> Olivia Llewellyn, Olivia Llewellyn. <laughs> um, someone uh, like I heard you say that, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> Well, some of that, I think Libby has mentioned before, it's like she wants to write a novel, but every time she's constantly getting invited to anthologies. Yeah, what's up with that? I mean, yeah, these what editors, the fuck? Yeah. yeah. Well, fine. you know the problem is if you're going to be that goddamn good, you're going to get these leeches who go, please, 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 Libby, oh, please, please. You know. The problem is is that I, I, I have a, this day job, you know, yeah. um... <laughs> Fucking day job pays all the bills, which is fantastic because I love having health care and I love, up all your time. <laughs> I love not living in a refrigerator box, mm -hmm. um, but you know it means from like seven in the morning to seven in the evening that my whole life is about the day job, 
And mm. so I come home and, you know, I can write for maybe an hour or two, but mainly I just want to go to sleep. <laughs> Yeah, I've always thought if I if I was if I won the lottery or something, I'd pick five or ten writers that I really yeah. like, like mm -hmm. and and just pay their expenses so they could just write all the time. There yeah. were a bunch of us last weekend talking about wouldn't it be nice to be one of these super rich guys and we could just buy some huge piece of property and you know have a writers commune. Yeah. Yeah. I think the same thing all the time. I, you know, I play the, that stupid publisher's clearinghouse, and you know, I buy lottery tickets. But it's not just for me. Um, there are so many writers out there who are struggling with health issues, you know, mental and physical. They have day jobs. They have families. You know, things that eat up their time, you know, and their life. And I would love to just be able to say, you know, something. Here's one part of your life you don't have to worry about. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know take that away from you and you you can focus on the other things the more important things yeah yeah, yeah. You know, no, you think about if that. you're listening you could you could like save the world for a, for a small monetary donation <laughs> i don't want to save the world i just want to save a couple people <laughs> well that's not <laughs> good that's no, a I long yeah i know i know <laughs> You find, Livia, that you can only get productive if it's like on a Saturday or Sunday morning if you can find time to write because then you don't have your job. Yeah. Actually, for the last week, I've been going to bed like between 8 and 9 p.m. and I've been getting up at 4 p.m. and writing for two hours. And I've I've been more productive in the last week than, than in the last couple of months. Just those those two hours... You know, it's only maybe five, six, seven hundred words, but it's completely quiet. It's finally cool in my apartment. You know, the rest of the world isn't up. I don't have to worry about the job. You know, I can just sit down and write and not be distracted by anything. And it, it's, I was shocked that it, that it came so easily to me. Um, of course, you know, when you don't have a family, you don't have to worry about, you know, allocating your time to other people. But, um... But yeah, I think I'm I'm gonna keep it up, you know, yeah, so that you know. I can write during the weekdays as well as just the weekend. Yeah, I, I generally found the morning is the most productive time because you tend to get, you know, I've got a day job too. So yeah. It's like in the evenings, I don't want to write. <laughs> yeah. I was about to say that wow. I, I'm I find, I'm very amazed. I've always been amazed since I've known you, Rick, at how productive you've been because you know unlike me or Joe you do have a day job you know? mm. and uh, the day job takes a hell of a lot of time you know as we all know so so yeah, yeah so good advice to all the writers well, watching Lydia's just giving you some great advice <laughs> well it's either that or you know right in the middle of the night which I've done before but you know I, it, I've always been a morning person so for me it's morning well, you, Olivia, that's exactly what I do. I don't sleep much. I, during the week, I sleep maybe three, four hours. <laughs> and then on Friday night, I'll, I'll crash for like 12. But I put the kids to bed around 8. Mandy goes to bed around 10.30. And I'm, I'm downstairs hitting the keyboards until 2 or 3 in the morning. Do you, do you find, Pete, that writing at night, you're more inspired? Because I do, although I'm, I'm extremely tired and don't always, I, the, the spirit's willing and the flesh is weak, but I night I'm more that, inspired. I've always done this. I mean, when I was in college, I got done stuff more stuff done between the hours of midnight and 4 a.m. than most people did all day. Yeah. Um, to paraphrase the old, you know, Marines, Army commercial, but... To me, writing at night, first of all, I can turn off the television because there's nothing but crap on. Um, I can put on whatever music I want, and I don't have to worry about Mandy or the girls complaining. <laughs> um, well, that's what you got headphones for. I do that. Y you know, I just I've never gotten into headphones. One I of the mean, I don't like them because I don't like having the wire in the way because I'm busy. I don't. Type sitting still, um, but still, if, if I don't want to bother yeah. anybody and I want it on, on, you know, 
Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the problem I often have with headphones is people mm-hmm. take advantage of the fact that I can't hear them. They, they sneak up on me and do things. So I, I don't enjoy it. Um, uh, well, yeah, they do that to me. What? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, when I'm busy writing, I, I go off in the zone. You you got to come in and you got to push me. Yeah. I, I don't know your stand and a foot for me. Yeah. I'm not here anymore. I'm somewhere else. So. You may recall the other night when I got startled by my son because I was in this zone here. Recall, we're going to make it into a best of collection of Lovecraft Easing shows. <laughs> Exactly. Nice shirt, by the way. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I figured I'd wear something appropriate for the dinner party we're throwing tonight. <laughs> oh, black tie, is it? <laughs> uh, yeah, Mandy's making chicken cordon bleu and, and uh, crab dip and stuff, so... Oh, fancy. Yeah. yeah where's, I, don't see, I don't see the Learjet out here waiting at... <laughs> you know, Joe, I'm working, no, no. On, I'm working on something, and I think... Next Saturday at midnight, if we do a show, we will. I'll figure out how to get some pizza to somebody. <laughs> uh, Pete, that would next be, Saturday. That would be a hell next of an Saturday. Saturday. Yeah, well, I think I know how that's going to happen. We'll, we'll, well, there's no question about us having a show. We will. All right. <laughs> I just have to remember to actually, you know, come home sober and stay up. <laughs> sober. Wow. All right, maybe. All right, just sober enough to log. You are a fiction like writer, aren't you? Yeah. He's a paperback writer. <laughs> no, but I, I, you know, the other thing that I have to say about the writing process is that when yeah. I tell Mandy that I need some time, she gives it to me. I mean, she gave me all day today, and just. I pound it out. I finished the story. Yeah, so. you know what? If you're not single, you have to have a, a spouse and a family that really understand that. Even the slightest, oh, I just want to ask you one question, is is jarring. You can't, it, when you're writing, at least for me, I get pulled right out of the zone. You know? Yes, I've, I've yeah, told them like that and, several and, times. Yeah, and, and there are times where... It, takes time to get back to where you were, even though it's mm-hmm. just a short period. You know, it's one little simple question. You know, right? It doesn't seem like much uh, to the person that's asking, but you got. Oh a no, and it's person. not their fault. They're not. No, doing but you got to. Spe- what I'm saying is, you have a special person and a special family when you when they realize that even that 10 second question is yep. too much. I mean, that's that. You know, you got to have that time where you're not bothered at all. Yeah. So. And you know, and when the moment that suddenly, suddenly everything clicks together, and you you figure out how you're going to get around that thing that was blocking you, mm. and that happens, and you so all of a sudden stand up and start shouting, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that the fact that they don't call the cops or the hospital or your your psychiatrist to prescribe more sedatives, <laughs> you know, you know, the dosage of lithium. You know that's real understanding. Yeah. Well, I, I it was me. It's no, not. He's not upset. That's not why he's swearing at the computer. You know. Do, do yeah. you ever act out your stories? Um. Read the dialogue to yourself and say, you know, it sounds that. I will. I, I I've often thought about that, and I thought about doing it. However, I one of my favorite movies that I watched when I was a very young kid was Death Trap. <laughs> Michael Caine and uh, Christopher Reeve. Oh, yeah. good movie. Yeah. yeah wonderful oh, film. I mean, never to do that. Christopher Reeve. Yeah. Would you why that's really a bad idea? So I don't do that. I do it in my head. I do it in the shower. Um, and I uh, let's not talk about writing in the shower. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you, you know, you're in there, and you got the soap, and you're doing this, and all of a sudden, you got a great line, and, you know, it's like Sonny Rollins with a saxophone up on the bridge. If you don't write it down, right that second, you're going to forget it. And you I, got this great line, 
and you start repeating it if it's, it's as if it's a mantra. And you repeat it, repeat it, re and you're starting to scrub faster because you got to get out and write this down, <laughs> you know, before you forget it. And then all of a sudden, about the 14th time you repeat the line, the sentence after it appears. So now you got like 52 words you're repeating in your head. Oh, I did. <laughs> well, um, hold on, Mike. Let me out of the bathroom, half dry, dripping all over the place. <laughs> Try, naked, trying to get to a pencil. <laughs> there was when, when the idea for the weird company came to me. Mandy pulled me out of the shower, at, out of the bathroom after three hours, and every mirror and glass surface was covered with soap notes. <laughs> oh boy! And I'm running, I'm running to get the camera. To, you, I, for some reason, I just you know it didn't dawn on me to get a pencil and, and get a, a piece of paper. No, I had to pick up a bar of soap and start you know putting character names and titles and chapter outlines down the, the glass wall, the glass door, all over the mirror. And you did this for three hours. I did it for three hours, and you know the whiteboard. She walked in and she's like, "What the hell are you doing?" And, you know, I'm like, go get me a camera. Just go get the camera. <laughs> and it, it stayed in the, in the bathroom for about a week before I was <laughs> letting it go. This okay. Is, this is like Richard Dreyfuss in uh, Close Encounters of the Third Yeah, Count. with the potatoes. Yeah. Did, you ever, did you ever write in the dark? Sometimes I got the pencil, I got the composition book, the words are coming, the light is on the other side of the room. So I'm in the dark, I can't see anything, and I'm hoping I'm going to be able to, you know, write, read it when I'm done. But I figure by the time I stop, go across the room, turn on the light, and come back, I'll break the mood. So it's dark, and it's like, I hope that was an I. H A V. -E. Livy's looking at us like we're crazy. Why? She's just not going to reveal all the weird-ass shit that she does. Because <laughs> process, every psycho, the process may be different, but we all do the same kind of thing. We just do it differently. Yeah, Christopher Gost is a viewer and a reader. He's watching right now. He says, Joe, I do this with music and lyrics all the time. So... What, are, what, what, are, what you said. All right, Mike, take us in a new direction, please. Well, <laughs> I, want to, I want to talk about... I, want to, I, I would like to ask a question, but I'll talk about HWA first. I would like to ask a question, a question about the process. But let's talk about HWA for a minute. Um, they just they made an announcement what, yeah. uh, this past week that... Um, you guys are more familiar with HWA than I am, but basically self-published writers are okay now for joining. You have to make at least $2,000 a year or something like that. I, I, pro, yeah, 200 bucks or something to be an yeah, associate. I think, it's, I think it's $200 to be an associate, um, $200 worth of sales, and to be a full member, you have to have $2,000 worth of sales. That's not per year. That's just for, for one work like a novel or a short story but it, to you know to have receipts or, or records saying that you made two thousand okay. dollars you know wherever you sold it so my first question for you guys for the panel is is I have, I have two main questions we can discuss this as little or as much as you want but my first question is what do you guys think about that and my second question is when it comes to HWA I was a member for a year and um, I always boil things down, make things simple in my mind when I'm thinking about them, and I ask myself simply, what is the benefit of me being a member of HWA? And I'm, I'm not saying this in a sarcastic way or a, you know, it sucks or anything like that. It's an honest question. So what do you guys think of the self-published thing, and what do you think the answer to that question is, the benefit of, of being a member? Okay, well, from an outside yeah. observer... If a person can make two thousand dollars in sales from self-published work, how is that lesser 
than someone who can sell two thousand dollars to the trades. You know, it's like, you know, what are they trying to do? I mean, if they're trying to like be a professional organization for people who try to make their living selling horror stories, why not? People are going to be doing more and more of this. The people who like write, you know, booty call of Cthulhu and don't make any money, they will, they'll still be excluded. You know, two thousand dollars is a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. well, what do you guys think? Of that? I mean, there's no longer a gatekeeper with that sort of thing. Who vets or are look? And I'll I'll be the bad guy. I'll get in trouble. I always do. Yeah, I know. Um, self publishing. <laughs> I'm sure there's some amazing things that get self-published, and I'm sure, just like anything else, the vast quantity of it is pure crap. Right. Okay. Um, and any the anybody can self-publish. Anybody. Okay. Um, who? So my first question is, who vets the work? Yes. If you're if you're self-publishing, you write this collection, fifty thousand words, x number of short stories. You know, it's called the Tattered King. You upload it to Kindle or Create Space or whatever those things are. There's your book. It's pub technically published. Who vetted the work? Well, it's not Olivia a matter of vetting. Livia, Pete, Laird, me, Willem, ad infinitum, Kathy well, Cogen. Go look at the, go look at this the, uh, work is delivered. The work is delivered to an editor. An editor says yes, no, change this. I don't like that. You mm -hmm. can't use this story. Um, hey, not this one. What about that other one? Um, you you got to bring your bona fides to somebody else. Some, and it's somebody else's money being spent, okay? It's a publisher's money being spent. It's an editor's anthology budget being spent. You, you got to pass muster. Well, see, the thing is, you're mistaking sales for quality. Everyone no, not. Knows. No, I, not. You put the book I, out. I, no, you bet in the book. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you, meaning the HWA, or Joe. I'm saying before we get to sales, oh, okay? Right. Well, well, yeah. Nobody. This is, this is the point. It's self-published. HWA says if you got $2,000 worth of sales, you're a professional. Professional what? Uploader? Yeah, I don't I mean, understand. Come on, the, let's be real. Me, me you know, I don't understand the criteria of $2,000. You got writers like Pete and Livia sitting right here. These people do work. You know, when they're done with their work, okay, now, I, we can get a million testimonials to how good Livia is, okay? She's already got them. She's got them. She's draped in testimonials. Her work is that good, okay? Well, I'm wearing okay. right now just testimonials. <laughs> okay. But when Livia yeah. is done and submits, that is not automatic acceptance. She has to. She got invited to a project. She, you know, she submits the work. It has to pass muster. You know what this whole thing has made me think of is the saying that no one is a writer or an editor until another writer or an editor says you're a writer or an editor. Well, that's. I think that's true. So, yeah. so what I'm saying is here. Here. Um, with, with an established track record um, that's in demand, who's a solid professional, and I, I can say that as an editor because she's written and delivered work to me, um, okay, and she got her work got vetted, mm -hmm. and her work gets vetted, so to what about these other people? Who vets it? So you sold two thousand dollars. Laird, when this came up, said, "Oh, so you put out a chapbook and uh, your your mother bought two thousand dollars worth to give to your cousin and your cousin and your fifty seventh cousin 
and her girlfriend in Santa Rosita. Oh, look at Johnny just had his book put out. Well, that's two thousand dollars worth of sales. Now I know that only criteria. Now I know that Pete has to go at the top of the hour, so I, I want to hear what Pete has to say about this. All right, so uh, long. Well, full full disclosure here. I was a member of HWA years ago, before I was uh, started really writing. After I sold my first short story, and then went into a lull, but then I, I dropped out. And after Reanimators came out, I thought about joining Cepha and HWA. And I will say that both of those organizations just seem to have imploded. That there is just so much infighting and drama that when you ask what's the benefit to me, I have to say I, I need less drama in my life so I can focus on writing. And getting involved with CEFA or HWA right now just doesn't seem to be something I want to do. Um... As for the self-publishing thing, I, I see Joe's point. I also see what Matt was trying to say in that this is the alternative route. Um, what I'm concerned about echoes what Joe is saying in that you can drum up $2,000 in sales rather quickly. Um, it, it's really quite easy. The other thing is, you know... It's it's sort of like I'm, I'm gonna tell this story when I when I fold, I sold reanimators and, and a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I mentioned on a panel that I was suddenly this editor's go-to guy for stories, mm -hmm. and I don't know how that happened. And this writer who I really respect came back and said, "Did you do what you said you were gonna do on time and on budget?" And I said, "Yeah." And he said, "You are 300 percent ahead of the game on most writers." And that most people, Absolutely. when given a deadline, simply cannot make it. And they will throw everything in the world So, at, to, to, as an excuse. So to answer your question, what makes a professional besides sales? It's acting like a professional. Doing what you, what you said you were going to do on time and hitting that deadline and producing what you said you were going to produce. And otherwise, you're looking for another publisher. And you can keep doing that, but you'll, you'll eventually run out. You'll uh, you know, lose your reputation. Exactly. So there's that other factor where if you're self-published, you could take 10 years to write a book, and the only person you have to ha make happy is yourself. And that mm -hmm. might be okay for some people, but for other people... You know, if I'm going to work with Joe, I know that Joe has a deadline. Yeah, you know, and I think it also, it, I've got, I've got I, I, a couple of editors that the novel I'm working on, the short stories I'm working on, and I'm slow, I grant you, because the easing keeps me so busy. But they've said, Mike, as long as it's decent, you know, we're very interested in looking at it and probably publish it. Well, my point is that it's horror, Lovecraftian. And I wouldn't dream of using the Lovecraft easing to publish it or to self-publish it. Um, I'm also working on a, I hate the term, but we'll just use it anyway, a self-help book of sorts. And I don't see the advantage of not self-publishing something like that. Um, there's, there's no reason not to. Um, I will tell you, as a former bookseller, I wish yeah. more self-help public books were published by themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it depends, certainly. Um, you know, I don't truly, I mean, it's, and it's, I say this without any malice at all. Way, it's going to get them a lot more members. What's that? You know, it's, a, it's a good thing for the HWA because there's all, it, it's going to get them a lot more members. Yeah, I saw right now they have about 800 members. No, but Okay, so as I was about to ask, what... I, and I say this without, I ask this without any malice at all. What is the benefit of, of me as an editor or a writer or anyone else joining HWA? In other words, what does it get for me? What does it do for me? 
Do you, you want know, an honest answer from me? I'll absolutely. Tell you. It absolutely. does absolutely nothing unless you want a Stoker Award. Um, I think uh, organizations are fantastic marketing tools and promotion tools, but in my opinion, both HWA and CIFA are for people who want to market and promote themselves specifically to HWA and CIFWA members. And there are very specific awards associated with those organizations. And there are, are people associated with those organizations that maybe as a writer you want to be associated with. Um, but joining those organizations, in, in my opinion, doesn't make you a professional or not a professional. It's just, it's another marketing tool. Like, do you want to join Twitter? Do you, do you want to be on Facebook? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not in HWA. That doesn't make me not a horror writer. Um, you know, but if I wanted a stoker or if I wanted in some way to associate myself with people who could get me a stoker, then I would join HWA. I mean, I know that sounds absolutely horrifying, disgusting, and repulsive to say, but that's the only reason I would join, is so that I could market the shit out of something in the hopes that I could get a Stoker nomination, which in and of itself devalues the award. <laughs> which begs so, the question, bye, bye. the thing I was going to ask was, no, what well, you have to say, Olivia, begs the question of, reason if you're a member of HWA, are you more likely to get a Stoker than if you're not? Yeah, if you're a, if you're a member, I think maybe. Uh, I honestly, I honestly, with the type of fiction that I write, I don't think that um, beyond the Shirley Jackson Awards, I'll get nominated for anything. Um, I, I just think there's still too many people who just see what I write as being really repulsive um, and and too female. Um, but that's that's a whole other issue. I just think that for certain people, yes. Yeah, a Stoker Award or a Stoker nomination would be a fantastic thing. And and so for people, whether they're self-published or published professionally, or I should say by legacy or whatever they're calling other, you know, traditional publishers nowadays, you know, if they want to join the organization and if they want to try to get a Stoker nomination and and network with that group of people, then I think it's fine. But but it has nothing to do with writing. Writing has nothing to do with organizations. It's it's or awards. Yeah, or awards. Yeah. It's it's what you do at four in the morning or at midnight, you know, and the conversation the you have between you and the editor, you know, or whoever is cre you know, helping you finalize, you know, that whatever what eventually gets published. It has nothing to do with organizations at all in any way whatsoever. Mm -hmm. If I if I uh, eventually ever publish a novel, I would love to join um, Authors Guild. Um, but really, why would I join Authors Guild except to get health insurance, which I already have? So, <laughs> and it wouldn't help me with my writing at all in any way whatsoever. Pen America now, Pen America, you know. Um, and it works with writers who are being oppressed and tortured in other countries, and you know that that might be a good organization for someone like me, who's interested in in helping those people. You know, it would it would be interesting to join that in, that organization. But the other ones, no, they won't help me as a writer. They won't help me get awards. They won't help me at all. If, if all right. people don't want to read my shit, they won't read it. You know, mm -hmm. the editors. No, right. oh, sorry. <laughs> No, it's okay. Go ahead. I was going to say that I, I've already met, you know, with the ex with one big exception, I've met all of the editors who will probably, you know, ever publish me that I really wanted to meet, and and you know, I'm I'm I feel like I'm set, you know. So I, I don't need those organizations. And now everyone at HWA will be like, fuck you. <laughs> and you know that's fine. That's fine. I'm not writing for now. I'm not writing for awards. I'm writing for I don't know, for myself and for maybe you know at the end of my life to say I did this and it was good. Well, when when the feeling among a lot of people is that you have to be a member of HWA to get nominated for a Stoker to win a Stoker, it kind of devalues it. Okay, but let me chime in here. Yeah, please. Grim, Grim Scribes Puppets made it to the final ballot for a Stoker. I'm not a member of the HWA. I was the editor. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the contributors to Grim Scribes Puppets 
are not members of the HWA, and the book did make it to the final ballot. So okay, let me let me let you continue, but I just want to interject real quick there that I am not saying that. I'm saying that I hear that there's that feeling among some people, so I'm asking the question. So right. go ahead. And, and I've I've heard that repeated a ton of times. So maybe they have inside information that I'm not privy to. Mm -hmm. But here here's a book I edited that did well, it sold well, it got a lot of positive reviews, it won the Shirley Jackson Award for, you know, uh, edited anthology, but it did, apparently on its own merits, make it to the final ballot of the Stokers. Um, and, like I said, at least half the contributors and me, the editor, are are not members of that association. Um, Is there a benefit, guys, to joining HWA besides probably networking? There's there's some very ta a lot of very talented people in the HWA. You know, be it Joe Lansdale or Ellen Datlow or whoever. You know, my understanding um, was you could network with those guys on their Facebook in their Facebook group, and you don't have to. Yeah, they they seem to be open, nice people. You don't you don't need the HWA to communicate with these people. Um, right. But I'm just saying, perhaps in right. networking. In other words, you can do the networking without joining, is what. It's See now, now you get into another issue, which is maybe one of the reasons HWA decided to do this was to try and keep themselves relevant. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, let me let me. Um, okay. Go, Go ahead, Pete. And I do Go got ahead, something Pete. to say. Go ahead, Pete. All right. So for 20 years, I sold books. Mm -hmm. and I specialized in fantasy, science fiction, horror, and mystery. I can count on one hand the number of times somebody asked me to give recommendations of books that won the Nebula or the Hugo. I can tell you that I've never was asked, you had the latest Stoker winner <laughs> or the Locust winner. The only <clears throat> I've ever been asked to, to supply that won awards were for awards that was either the Pulitzer or the Edgar. I, I got to say, though, let's look at this for me as a customer doing a lot of my shopping online because here I am in Peoria. It's like I would go on Amazon and I'd click open the list of the latest Stoker winners and the Edgar winners when I was trolling for books. So I did refer to those lists. But I don't know any better, you know? I didn't. Yeah. Uh, I think though you're. And what's a nice way to say this? You're you're may, you you you're highly intelligent, Matt. Um, huh. I don't think that everybody would do it that way. Or any people would. I'm not saying that the awards aren't important and they don't serve a function. I'm just saying that when it comes to the genre, I'm not sure that they're accomplishing what they set out to accomplish. Right. And Can I just say one more thing? thing? I, I read the Traveling Vampire Show. Who wrote? Who the hell wrote that? Because it got it got a stoker. It sucked donkeys. It's <laughs> forget it. No, forget that though. Because whether or not you like the book, Layman's a pro. Okay. Let's look at this. Is okay. You need two thousand dollars worth of sales to be a pro. If we go to Amazon, you're going to find there's an author who's written a series of horror books. I fuck Godzilla. I fuck Cthulhu. I fuck Bigfoot. I and you name. You've given away my titles, man. <laughs> I'm totally huh? missed out. I totally missed out on the I fuck series. <laughs> okay, there there must be thirty of these. I fuck the Phantom of the Opera, I fuck Frankenstein, and that's what they're called, okay? All right, so you put out a million of these books you self-published. They're horror, okay? That When I first encountered these books, I went, huh? And, and I went to Amazon, and you can read the first couple of pages, you know, sample the book kind of thing. And, you know, there it is, I fuck Cthulhu. And you start reading, 
And Mike, you know what your slush pile's like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it, Mike, there's things in your slush pile that I've helped you read that are better than this book. Okay, so here's somebody who probably has buku sales. And oh, yeah, there's some self-published authors that are making some decent... Yeah, so here's somebody who's who's got all the monetary credentials to be part of this organization. Do I want to be... You know, all right, I probably could be in the HWA as a professional. You know, I got sales, I got credentials, blah, blah, blah. Do I want to be associated with this person? I'm a member of this association. Oh, and when we look down the list, so is it, I fucked Cthulhu. What well, you know what Mark said. Right. Well, the thing is, though, is that, um, I mean, before this, before they made this change, People were, you know, sometimes making, many times maybe, making fun of the quality of HWA writers. This, so it's not about, it's been about quality. It's been about sales. You know, how do you how do you get into the organization? It's not by proving that you're an excellent writer in any way. It's about sales. You make three sales at X markets, you get in. So. I I can't really throw stones at people who are self-published and say you you know you can't you can't get into this organization when this organization is has already made they've made rules saying that it's about the sales it's not about the quality it's about the sales so yeah. you know I, and and it depends if you're the kind of writer who wants to 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 um to say you're professional because of sales, then that's fine. If you're the kind of writer who says you want to be professional because of the quality of the work that you do and the places you publish with and the editors who accept your work, then you don't need the organization. Uh, you know, that. what it seems to me, which will never happen, but it, an organization like HWA that instead of a membership fee to get in and so many sales, $2,000 in sales or whatever it is for whatever qualification you meet, uh, they read your work and decide that the quality gets you into the organization. No other reason, you know. That would be fine, except that then who, what group of people decide, you know, what, what constitutes quality horror. Um, mm -hmm. For many people, you know, I, what I write is not the kind of, you know, fiction, the kind of horror that they would publish. They might not like Lovecraftian. They might not like body horror. They might not like, like literary horror. So well, I, you're, you're so right. It is subjective, but it's the same thing as, um, you know, Laird Barron just doing the best weird fiction of the year. He's saying, okay, out of all the stories in 2013, here's the weird fiction that I, I want in this anthology. Yeah. Right, but Laird is going to say exactly that, that I selected. He's not going to tell you he's the end-all, be-all. He's going to tell you that what I was able to read, and this is what I picked. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, so, Joey, are you saying that HWA is sort of trying to be an end-all, be-all, or are you saying something else? No, I'm I'm just I'm just saying, you know, Laird is. No, that was just not, an example. Not, I picked Laird. Laird's Laird is back. Laird is not saying I'm the final authority. I'm the only authority. Laird is saying this is my valued opinion. That's all. No, um, my point is that any any opinion on uh, whether something's quality or not it is subjective. So. Oh, um, that's true. Um, you know. Uh, I'd rather see a jury, complete jury system, the way the Jacksons are. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, uh, and, and and yeah, I, okay. I just won a Shirley Jackson award. Trust me, I'm extremely, I'm still giddy over that. Um, you know, Livia was nominated. I'm still giddy over over that. Um, 
Okay, but so previous, pre on previous to board. this year, so that bias aside, previous to this year, mm -hmm. when I look at the, those works, I, I was impressed. Those, those are works I sought out to read because you don't buy them. Nobody gets on any of those lists because they're somebody's friend, you know. Um, I, I was a member of the H many, many years ago, a well over a decade. I was a member of the HWA for five years, you know. Um, so I thought, okay, I'm I'm new with this. You know, I'll get tips, and they'll tell me. Now, there's one positive: is the HWA has a newsletter. They'll talk about open markets and closed markets, and I assume there's articles on agents, and I assume there's articles on how to write. Um, yeah, and, and that's that my stuff. question. My question about whether are there benefits isn't. Uh, an ironic, sarcastic, oh, we know there's no benefits question. It's an honest question. So, yeah, and, you know, and, and I'm not trying point. to. One of, that's one of the benefits. Now, on the uh, message board, Joe Contour has a question about HWA or similar organizations. Here it is. But what if you have a beef with somebody on the board? How do you keep from being blackballed? You know, and does this happen? That kind of thing. Um, I don't know. I'm not in. I yeah. don't know. I don't know hopefully, either. Hopefully it's, you'd like to think a professional organization, you know, that won't happen, but, you yeah. know. So. All right, let's go someplace else. Yeah. <laughs> so, can I, okay. Can I say I, you know, what's that? Go ahead, Libya. I just want to say that um, I was in HWA for a year. I was in CIFA for a year. Um, and, and just what I learned about myself was that I have my own criteria for being a professional writer, in particular a professional horror writer. <coughs> and, um, you know, I, have a, I had a small spreadsheet with a very small list of goals. You know, being in an anthology, um, you know, edited by Ellen, being in, in a best of with Ellen. <laughs> a lot of it had to do with Ellen. Um, yeah. <laughs> getting a Shirley Jackson nomination, you know, being professionally published, you know, in in a market like Subterranean Press. You know, I think that that ultimately every writer needs to decide for themselves, you know, what goals they accomplish would make them a professional writer. And and if joining HWA is one of them, then I and they're self published, I think they should go ahead and do it. It's not for me. It's not for a lot of horror writers. You know, but you know, I think everyone has their, their own goals then and you know, you you need to do what you need to do to achieve them. And if well, joining let me close this, is, um, kind of, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I, I was kind of wrapping up. You know, if joining HWA is is one of your goals, then that's fine. It actually was one of my goals at one time, and I, I realized after a year it, that that wasn't what I needed. Was so it expensive? What were the yearly dues? Um, I think right now they're like seventy or seventy-five. I, I I think it might have been around sixty or sixty-five when I joined. It was about seven or eight years ago. Well, let me let me close this particular topic with this, just to say this. I'm not against HWA, and hopefully the questions I've asked just now, um, I've made it clear that these are honest questions that I do, don't have the answers to and I want p opinions on. But if but we have to be able to have honest conversations about this and this type of thing. So mm. that's why I wanted to discuss it. So. Yeah, I'm sorry, and I'm sorry if I was heavy-handed, but. No, not at all. Not at all. I, I think it's worth talking I mean, talking. now, one other, one other thing is, is I know the HWA has quite a few local chapters. They're, they're like HWA writers groups. Um, again, you know, if you're the right kind of beginner and you want to write horror, there may be very good advantages. You know? Um, yeah. I just... Like I said, open it up to anybody who made two grand. I just don't see that. 
Mm. You know, it, let's talk about self-publishing and not the HWA for a minute. If you're going to self-publish, like I, I talked about this one book I'm working on that's going to be self-published, you know, that doesn't mean that you can't have several editors looking at this, telling you which parts are crap and no, you know, you doesn't. need more, more than your own opinion, you, you, no matter if you self-publish or not. Okay. Cisco just had a bunch of ebooks come out. They were put out by the Vandermeers. They got vetted. I mean, they were already out as, as, as trade paperbacks, as hardcovers, so they were already established. There's writers out there who had books published, I don't know, in 1989, and the rights have come back to them. And they're now self-publishing because it's, it's possible, and they can put a book that's out of print back out you know, yeah, that's, some that's of this different. is that's really good minority, stuff. Right? Some of it's really good. Writers who we've never heard of, I am sure that there is some really good stuff being self-published. But just like music, just like professionally published material, there's also a lot of crap. You know, um, I'm not opposed to self-publishing. Uh, it can be a good thing. It just, if even if you're self-publishing, I think you need somebody to vet the work. Um, um, you need, you don't want your your friends putting up reviews. There was something that came out a few months ago. You know, self-publish Cthulhu Mythos. Um, you know, by Mr. Blah Blah Blah, and all these glowing five-star reviews. And if you start doing a little research on the net, you'll find out that like one of the glowing five-star reviews is by a guy that wrote this book. And this guy, who just gave a glowing review, the review under him, well, it looks like that review is by a woman that, um, according to another page, he's in a relationship with. So, you know, so I just think self-published is be wary most of these things are up there. You can read the beginning. If you hear something's good, read it before you buy it. Yeah. I mean, this you, you can way back before you, you can tell if somebody can write or not in a page. Yeah, Matt. What? You, this guy, did you did you ever read a book called Other Nations? Hmm. Yes. By, by yeah. the Marshes. Okay. In the days of Amazon, when I still had time to write reviews. There was a review about this book on Amazon that was really quite good. And it, it took me some digging. I figured out it was by the author. And mm -hmm. I got into a kind of a flame war in the old days of alt.horror.cthulhu with her. About like... Oh, okay. I think I know who you're talking about. Yeah, now. I... I it... It's like, how wrote how something you possibly with, uh, do this? Price once. You, know, you got in a flame war with her, and you're still alive. You got moats and stuff around your house. <laughs> well, it's like it's like I I basically took her to task for like oh. <laughs> publishing this review as though it was not by herself. That's mm. dishonest. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one. You know. Um, yeah, that's uh, no, that's dishonest. I don't care how book the how how good the book is. Yeah. And, or not. Or not? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, for, okay. for people, now the most important there's thing. There's also publishers out day. there. There's also publishers out there who are, are not doing ebooks, so they may buy your book, and it may be a good book, and it got vetted, and it got vetted by a serious editor and whatever. But there's no ebook, so you can put an ebook out on your own. You know, that, that's, and, but that's not the same type of self-publishing I'm talking well, about. Well, no, it's that's, that's true. It's not. Um, well, uh, let me ask a question. Of, let me ask a question on 
a different topic, but related to that, I noticed um, some people complaining, justly or unjustly, is what I want to ask you guys. Um, there's, I'm not going to mention the name of the book, but there's a, a, a mythos book that was just published, and it's an expensive mythos book, and before, not only is it more expensive than most of us can afford, but it sold out extremely quickly. So there's some people that wanted to read these stories, wanted to buy this book that A, can't afford it, and B, because it, it's there's only a limited number of copies, they can't buy it even if they could afford it. And some people were complaining about, well, why don't they make a Kindle edition for us poor people? Um, go. <laughs> 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 what are you guys' thoughts on that? And I'll tell you mine after you guys talk. Well, I, I, like, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like these reprints to be inexpensive. That's why we're, you know, much as I, I do buy a lot from, I started to buy a lot from Centipede, but I mean, you know, th those are taking a big chunk. Yeah. And it's like Chaosium gave you these nice, decent, Hard covers, which weren't too expensive, and uh, Fedigan and Bremer is, uh, you know, a little more pricey, but not that outrageous. But they're nice books, but we can usually afford them if we save up for a week or two. Yeah. Well, some of these publishers are a few of them. You know, they're going to put out this expensive hardcover, maybe it's in a slipcase. It's got all the bells and whistles, and then, you know, in a year, they'll put out the $20 trade paperback. And yeah, and but I'm that, talking I about a situation where they're saying they are not going to do that. No ifs, ands, or buts. If, oh. you, if you couldn't afford $150, $200, whatever it was for this book, and you didn't buy it in time, you were out of luck for all the time. That's what they're saying. Okay, all right. Then I think, then I think the publisher does readers a disservice. Because I think it also it does the writers a disservice, especially yes, I was, I was gonna those get writers that. who maybe, you know, there's a couple writers in there, this is their first really big sale, they're really excited, they think a lot of people are going to read their stories, they're mm -hmm. going to get a lot of publicity, and there's nothing. You know, nothing. Yeah. The, so, Mike, I, I know what you're talking are, about. The yeah. people, and, I'm I'm sorry, somebody, and, and I know somebody in the context of a conversation once and everybody was joking around and and I said geez I'm sorry it wasn't a hardcover I would I know how cool that would have been then for you to have your first thing in a hardcover and and the person said no are you kidding it's, it's a twenty dollar book people get to read it they get well, to, they'll get to read my story right that, and that's what the writers want and I'll tell you what Pete and Pete, you're next. But a mountain will walk before I'm able to afford some of these books. You know what I'm saying? So go ahead, Pete. <laughs> All right. So I know the book you're talking about, and I have put in a request for a review copy, the review for New York Review of Science Fiction. Uh -huh. And I have debated long and hard about buying the book straight out. And after seeing the the contents list. My conclusion, as much as it, I, it pained me, was that I have half the stories already. Yeah. So I'm paying in for half a book. Now, it's a beautiful book. Don't get me wrong. And if I owned it, I'd probably love it. But I can't afford to spend Cthulhu bucks on some, on half of something I already have. <laughs> Just let, me put it, let me put it by my perspective of this is... Okay, the person publishing the book is doing it for their own purposes. They're not doing it to be egalitarian or bring Cthulhu to the masses. They like pushing, putting out arty books. They like putting out a small limited series. I mean, who's that Dynatox Ministries? He publishes limited runs of teeny books of like 25 copies. Mm -hmm. You know, which can be just as hard to get. This is a mm -hmm. much more expensive book, but the publisher loves the craftsmanship that goes involved. He picks the paper, he fusses over the print. He sells all of his copies out, and he's met uh, his expenses for the month or the quarter or whatever. He doesn't really owe us anything in terms of like bringing this 
to everybody. He, he has to uh, be able to satisfy his own business model and make himself happy. Yeah. Really not. Right. It's not a book. It's like an. It's like an object of art. It's an artifact. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I've, I've had to call that. Something like this is not really meant to be read the same way you read a paperback. It's meant to be collected. All right, let's talk about this from the standpoint of the writer. Do, do, we want to go, guys? do we want to actually talk about this book a little? Well, let me ask this question. If you had a choice between being published in a book like, like these books that we're talking about, or you had a choice being published by, uh, oh, name, name somebody. Um, Chaos you. Chaosium that a lot more people are going to read your story, even though the other one's a nicer, physically a nicer book and more expensive book. As a writer, wouldn't you choose, for example, Chaosium because more people are going to read the book? Can, can I read I'm, your story? Not being the writer here, but you know, um, I kind of look at this. Remember our talk about C.J. Henderson? Yeah. I read an interview by him from 2011. He says, "I'm going to do whatever's going to send me the paycheck." Okay. Yeah. All right. That's one All right. of you. So yeah. here's here's Joe Pulver who's got a collection coming. There's Libby Llewellyn who's got a collection coming. And you know, here's no Simon wants. Strand. Here's Simon Strand has got a collection coming. And here's Daniel Mills got a collection coming. And Karen Warren and Kath. Joe freeze. <laughs> <laughs> I think his point may be that uh, a lot of these stories are going to get reprinted. They're going to get what? What about Rats by a great author? Oh, Say that actually, again. I, I can answer your question. Of, of yeah. whether, um, I if I if this is the the uh, anthology that I think it is, I would love to have that particular editor. You know, pick a story for for anything he does. Um, evidently, he doesn't know that I exist, which is a real like. <laughs> That's surprising to me, but yeah. Okay. This is me off, but there's nothing I can do about it. But on the other hand, um, Brian Keen came up to me a couple months ago. He called me and said, "I would like you to send me a novella." for uh, an anthology I'm doing and it's going to be published by X Press and you know it's gonna have my name on it and would you do it and I said absolutely fucking lutely yes Brian Keene's fans are not typically the kind of readers who would read anything that uh, that I would ever write and so this is like a, an absolutely massive opportunity for me to get uh, readers introduced to my work um, yeah. and it's not going to pay as much maybe as what the what editor X might have paid me for a short story uh, but it, you know it's it's an incredible opportunity to be represented by someone who's considered an icon and a master of, of horror so so yeah I, I, I will in in this instance I would definitely pick Brian Keene's you know invite over editor X who will probably never invite me to anything. <laughs> yeah. Also, there's decisions that you make based on the long view and the short view. If you can't make the rent, you know, yeah. you're that's, make that's true. Decision. And yeah. having a day job helps me make decisions that most writers who don't have day jobs couldn't make, you know. Mm -hmm. So I do have that I, in I don't know. I got cut off, so I don't know what you heard or what you didn't hear. Yeah, we, uh, Matt kicked you out. No, I'm kidding. Oh, okay. <laughs> you were talking about different than uh, you were talking yeah, let's, about. Let's, let's say in any collection. calendar year, we we have a bunch of collections come out by Livia and Simon and a whole bunch of people. You know, I I want a nice twenty dollar trade paperback that looks good and you know it's well made that I can afford to buy. Um, as a writer, I want something the reader can afford because look at all these other ones they got they want to buy that year too. You know, I mean, I, I you know don't want a six hundred dollar book that you know three people can afford. You know, I I think most of us 
who really care about this, we want to be read. That's why we're doing it. Um, yeah. Yeah. My, my question is, Matt, you did... I'm largely on the... I lar I'm largely on the other side of this, Matt, but you made a really good point if I'm looking at both sides of this, which is absolutely what I want to do, not just present one side. And your point was that they don't owe anything to us to print more copies and so on and so forth. Um, you know, I, I guess I think books are for everybody, not just those that can afford it, but you still make a good point. My question is this. After the 500 copies at 150 apiece or whatever, um, and they've made their financial goal, the publisher has, I don't understand any negative with making a Kindle copy that most of us can afford. I, I don't see any downside. Well, there's no downside, but first of all, most of these stories are already reprints. Okay, so yeah. like Livia says, it's a collector's item. But second of all, you know, let's just say Mr. Editor or Mr. Publisher doesn't want to fuck with it. You know, it's yeah. like he's he's busy. He's got other titles coming up. He's got a he's got a, a young son he wants to take care of. You know, like we all know that. Um, maybe it's just not a point of interest for him. Um, I don't know because he's not the only one. He's just like hey, this one just got a certain amount of um, notice. But the same thing used to happen with Mythos books. I mean, there's no cheap copy available of the Drums of Chaos by Tierney. Um, the weirder shadows over Insmith hardcovers from Fedigan and Bremer are quite expensive. Uh, but did you ever get up to read The Light is the Darkness by uh, Laird Barron? Mm -hmm. the, yeah. the edition was uh, quite expensive. But um, there's a Kindle edition now, too. Well, right. that's because that's what the publisher wanted to do that. Yeah. I, I, I really would rather everybody gets to read everything, but uh, I just think that this guy's a craftsman, the, guy, the publisher. He really is. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He may not want a Kindle edition. I mean, you know, you're creating something with leather and you've got beautiful plates of artwork and, you know, if you if you spend hundreds of hours, you know, creating some kind of painting, do you really want someone to take a photo of it and put it online? You know, I mean, and your, it's, it's for your, everyone. Some, you know. Does your opinion on this change, uh, Matt and Livia and Joe and Rick, if this particular example we're talking about, if it's not reprints, if they're all original stories, no one can read them anywhere else if they can't afford this book. Does your opinion change any? Um, it would make me more uh, uh, more likely to buy the book. Yeah. See, it's hard for me to speak about this particular book because it's been so six years in the making, and I have an original in the book that's Nobody but the editor and publisher has seen for six years, you know. Um, I'd like people to read the story. So after six years, here comes the book, and not many people get to afford it. And I can't reprint the story for a year. So, That's only a year, though. Another yeah, well, year. It's already been six years since the story was bought. So um, it's going to be seven to, years since you wrote it. I want to show you something. Okay, this is the dark homage of, uh, I think it was Delirium Press. I think they may have gone under by now. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, these were six Lovecraftian novellas. Uh, I chased this down for um, 12 years to try to get a copy. And what I see out of this is... Only a few of these titles have ever been reprinted. Um, here's one by Matt Cardin, The God of Foulness. Mm -hmm. y you know, so, so I don't know. It's like, uh, I, I just think that uh, by now, after this many years, the title should have reverted back to the author, and he should be free to publish it in another forum. Or self-publish it. Well, he may well. Right. Who, who knows why he hasn't? Um, uh, 
Well, you know, I, I mean, ultimately, I think, I, I mean, I've heard Laird say that he'd like his work to be read. I, I know I've heard Cisco say he wants his work to be read. You know, th those those are those are guys who aren't looking to put out hundred dollar books. Um, now, if you're going to do that, if you're going to put out, you know, the hundred dollar, you know, seventy five copies, slip case, and then you know, uh, fifty five dollar hardcover that's limited, and then a trade paperback. Oh, okay, cool. The collectors oh, sure. that's, that's can have cool. their expensive volume, and you know everybody can pick whatever they want. I I right. think that'd be a good thing. Um, but end of the day, for me, it's like I want something that readers can afford and can get their hands on. I, you know, um, ultimately, I I'm in agreement. I'd really rather everybody gets to read everything, because then it can lead to you know more discussion and sharing and I can talk to my friends about the stories, you know? Yeah. But uh, I just feel like that's what we want, but the uh, producers are in, in no way obligated to do that. No, well, but and, and the other thing too is, is like the book we're all talking about, that is a specialty publisher. They don't make any bones about the fact that they're a specialty publisher. They're not publishing for the masses. Um, you know, so. And my biggest problem is what um, I think Livia said. I got the Masters of the Weird Tale Lovecraft by Centipede Press, mm -hmm. and I went to actually try to read it. So I was sitting on the couch, and I put it on my stomach, and I couldn't breathe. <laughs> so heavy. <laughs> yeah, I can barely lift those books. Yeah. Not so much the the Cutner and the and the uh, Belknap Long and the Jacoby. Oh, you know the the Mackin and the Blackwood are like Oxford dictionaries. You need a podium for crying out loud. They're they're unbelievably massive. You know, um, ultimately, there are two sides to this, um, and I'm glad just like with the other topic we can discuss both sides so uh, but again you know things like this are worth discussing so well, uh, one thing I, I, I just want to point out is that even if you get your mass market paperback depending on what how the publishing uh, industry is working at the time it's not a guarantee you'll be able to pick up a copy because I remember yeah, when, when I was reading in the 90s, the Avathos cycle by Bob Price, he says, oh, here's a story called Idiot Savant. It's by C.J. Henderson. He's got this great series called Teddy London, which I had never heard of. There's six books already. They've only been out for like hmm, two years. So I order them. I go to the bookstore. You can only find the first one and the last one. I write to the publisher. The four ones in the middle are all out of print, even though they're only two years old. Mm. Well, well, the, I mean, or the internet, you wouldn't have yeah. been able to pick up the ones. Well, avail we're talking about availability. Look at look at what's going on with with Amazon and what's the other place, Hatchet or something. Hatchet Book Group. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's a whole parcel of books you can't get. Because Am these people do not want to kowtow to Amazon's demands. What are you talking about? It appears that Amazon wants a group of publishers to allow Amazon to buy books at a certain price. You know, a discount. Mm -hmm. And these publishers can't afford to sell them at that discount. To Amazon, their books are already discounted. So and Amazon has just stopped carrying all these books. Or what seems to happen is they have the book, say they say they're carrying it, you order it, and then it just keeps getting delayed, delayed, and delayed. And unless you cancel the order and order directly from the publisher, you're never going to get that book. Yeah, right. you know, Scott Nicoli just emailed me the other day and said Dennis at Fidogan. I never remember if I'm saying it right. 
uh, Fadogan and Bremer, um, Scott's book, um, Anakai Tengata. Uh, Amazon suddenly has an issue with it they don't understand, and it's not available to Amazon, just out of the blue. Yeah, I, I had to cancel my order of that and mm -hmm. and buy it directly from the publisher. Book. I mean, that's one thing, I've and I've heard this from several small presses because I've worked with a whole bunch. A lot of times it's very difficult for them because... Amazon wants such a deep discount to before they'll even consider buying the book. So, you know, you look down, it's a $20 trade paperback, you know. Um, but that's not what the publisher's got to sell it for. Right. So it gets harder for that really small press to make any money off of that book. Because they're, you know... Um, when it, whenever possible, you know, especially, especially if it's a writer and a small press you really like, buy from the small press. Yeah, you're you're paying a couple bucks more, but that couple bucks more is helping the small press and helping that writer. You know. Well, and I'll tell you, I I'm a publisher, small publisher. And so maybe I shouldn't be the one saying this, but we should thank our lucky stars for for small publishers, you know, Chaosium on down, because they're not in this for the money. They're in it to bring these books to people, you know, most of oh, them. They're, they're, they're not making they're, they're, any goddamn money. I mean, none of us are. They, they, Derek at Hippocampus has been doing this all these years. It's a la yeah. really a labor of love. It is. That's exactly you know? what I'm saying. He's not. He's not getting rich off this. Dennis no. is not getting rich off this. He's spending his retirement money on it. You know. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Let's face it. Very few small press books become hits. You know. But yet they're they're bringing us stories that wouldn't be they're, available to the readers yeah, if they weren't there. You know. Yeah. They're they're putting out things like Engines of Desire. You know, this is where the really great books are coming from. You know, uh, Simon Strance's new collection, like Burt Black Sons, is a hippocampus book. You know? Well, those uh, of us who are Lovecraftian and Mythos fans, we've been dependent upon the small press for forever. Yeah. The major publishers wouldn't give us anything except yet another book of Lovecraft reprints. Yeah. Okay. In, in 1999... Um, one of the Brian Lumley, who at that point was a tour A-list writer, author, selling Buku books. All his Necroscope stuff was selling like wildfire. He wanted tour to put start re releasing, um, put out some of his Cthulhu, you know, mythos stuff. He wanted Titus Crow back in print and this and that. And Tor didn't want to talk to him about it. You know, this is one of their A-list authors. It's time to renegotiate a contract. And they have no interest at that point in anything by their best-selling writer that had anything to do with Lovecraft. You know? Um, Lovecraft is... Now that it's become the cottage industry that it is, we're we're starting to see some. I mean, ST's got quite a few things coming from Titan, um, but that's still limited. It's not where the majority of this stuff is. Um, whether it's a, a a Steve Kem or a Richard Gavin or um, or Karen Warren, or, or Cisco even. I, I mean, Langan, it's, it's all in the small presses where it's happening. Yep. Um, now, for those those watching that you're, yeah, I should do this more often, uh, I should do this every time we have a show, that don't know any of us except for our face, by our face, um, Pete's not here anymore, he had to go do something. Pete is the author of, uh, I'd like to just short, quickly go down the list of you guys. Pete is the author of uh, Reanimators, Pete Rollick, and it's, it's a very, very good uh, uh, mythos book. 
Uh, if you like the Reanimator movie or you like that story, you're going to love this book. Um, and Rick, uh, Rick, you like? Why don't you talk a little bit about what you write for? for uh, I've written a book called Fiction Shadows of the Opera. Is the series I write, which uh, if you like the Shadow and Doc Savage and the Avenger, you would probably mm -hmm. like that. And I've done uh, reference books on Doc Savage and the Shadow and other pulp heroes. Uh, I set up a redirectional website for Rick and for Joe, but uh, well, we'll get to Joe in a minute. It, Joe, uh, Rick, I'm sorry, I got some kind of block in my brain. Lay or lie? I can never remember. Well, I, my, my side of the family pronounces it lay. Okay, so, but if you go to ricklay.com, ricklai.com, it will automatically forward to uh, Rick's page on Amazon with his with the list of his books and so forth. So that's all you got to remember is just go to ricklay.com. Um, Matt has reviewed a hell of a lot of Lovecraftian books for years, and a lot of people uh, rely on his opinion on a lot of the latest books. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Matt, or not, but it's up to you. Define what you mean by a lot. <laughs> I have no idea. I just know it is a lot. <laughs> Uh, Livia, Engines of Desire, you want to talk about anything else? Uh, no, that's my short story collection, and a lot a lot of my fiction has been published online, so if you go to the website, you can find the links to it. Okay. And then Joe is a writer and editor. He just won some obscure award. I don't know what it was, but, you know, Shirley Jen or something like that. Shirley Jones. Shirley Jones, okay. <laughs> yeah. Or uh, Grim Scribes Puppets, which is a Thomas Ligotti um, tribute anthology. So, you know. Uh, oh, same thing with Joe's uh, website. Go to joepulver.com. It'll take you to his Amazon page. Uh, Joe, you can add anything to that that you want. I have a few mixed genre collections out. A lot of King and Yellow stories in them. Quite a bit of Lovecraft in them, you know. Like, like Livia, I've been in a whole bunch of various anthologies. You know, one of Ellen's best horror of the year, and Children of Old Leech, the Laird Baron tribute that just came out from uh, um, Word Horde. Another That's excellent really small like press. That's really a good book. Exactly. I think so, but I'm biased. So, which is I missed it. Including my own story, I think it's a pretty damn good book. Children of Old Leech. Oh, yeah, yeah that is a good book. Um, yeah. Definitely pick that up if you're watching the Children of Old Leech. I've I've been in a couple of STs, Black Wings books, and yeah, you know, I've been lucky. I've been in a bunch of. Uh, Joe also <laughs> edited um, issue thirty. For me, he's the only other guest editor I've had so far, although there are some more coming up. Um, edited issue 30 of the Lovecraft Easing, which is a king and yellow issue. And um, a lot of people that are, that excuse me, like king and yellow stories or similar themed stories have really enjoyed that issue. You can, or you can go to lovecraftzine.com and just click on on read the magazine on the left or magazine at the top. You can order a Kindle or print edition, uh, which was came out beautifully, or you can read it online for free, whatever you want to do. And all you and all the people who commented about that issue, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. And so so don't the contributors. Um, uh, Beautiful cover. Yeah, great great cover art. So before we go, I think the most important thing we could talk about today is the leaked Batman vs. Superman teaser trailer from Comic-Con. Right, mm -hmm. Joe? <laughs> I didn't see the trailer. All I saw was a still image of Wonder Woman's costume, which was disappointing. Yeah. I, yeah. I find it offensive that we're giving Wonder Woman short shrift. She's a great character. I don't think she needs to be monkeyed around with. I need. I think she needs to be delivered to the public the way she has existed 
previously. Um, it's 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 a it's a great character, and it's a rich character. So DC, stop fucking with something that ain't broke. <laughs> They've not done as well with the movies, I don't think. What's huh? that? For the most part, they haven't done as well with the movies. If they're no, well, their movies. Are, well, Green Lantern. They, they they tried to stick too much stuff in there. You know. Well, if, they've if, done a great if, job with their animated movies. I mean, they're really excellent. No, if 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 they had done the Green Lantern animated film as well, if they had taken that script. For the live action, that would have been an excellent introduction to the character for, you know, um, middle America that's unaware of Green Lantern. What yeah. they produced was too much. They stuck too much in there. They wanted to get too much accomplished in, in the context of a single film, an introductory film. That, Mar that Mar Marvel has a better business model at this point. That, that's the problem with most superhero movies, in that they try to introduce the hero, his arch enemy, right away, so he has a grand fight. <coughs> they need to gradually build these things. Mm -hmm. Which is like, what Marvel Marvel's done a piece at a time, you know, until we get to a point where we can just put out a. Okay, you know what I said earlier about presenting both sides of everything. I lied. This is a DC show, okay? <laughs> <laughs> <I'm just> kidding. <laughs> I, you know, I'm not saying that because Joe Pulver's a Marvel guy. So. Well, no, no, well, no, no, no. Yeah, make mine Marvel, indeed. I'm a Kirby fanatic, but you know, there. If if the top three superhero movies get made solely by what I want, it's Doctor Strange, it's the Inhumans, and it's the Spectre. There's a lot of DC I like. Yeah. I, I think they're stupid not to do the Spectre. Why isn't DC doing the Teen Titans? If you go to uh, they make the Teen good. Titans of Wolfman and Perez, that first couple of, those first 20, 24 issues were wonderful. Those are great characters. It was great storylines. Did you like the cartoon? I love the cartoon. Yeah, the cartoon's fun, but skip that. I'm talking about going back to when Perez and 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 Marv Wolfman resurrected the new Teen Titans, and they were doing a bang up job. You know, DC has properties. They're ju they're just focused on a couple of icons and well, can't get their they, head out of their ass. They made the Teen Titans as Young Justice. Which is what the best cartoon series they ever did. Birds of Prey would be a great movie. It's I'm sorry, uh, but Brett, George, Brett George on the message board just reminded me. I posted about this three or four days ago, but I never would have, would have read this comic in a million years. But somebody on the message board told me I should pick it up. I did. And I, put, I posted an article about it, um, about the uh, afterlife with Archie, number six. Oh, have any of you guys read it? My copy's on order. Teenage Witch is the bride of Cthulhu. She's the daughter of the King in Yellow. You, I, there's no way I'm reading that. Well, yeah, that was exactly my reaction until I read it, and I thought it was pretty damn good. Um, so I do recommend that people pick it up if you got a couple of extra bucks. I'm just going to interject and say goodbye because I don't read comics and I give this many shits about the movie. <laughs> <laughs> At least you're honest. I'm not even going to lie. <laughs> so no, well, I gotta go anyway. I wanted to bring that up at the end. <laughs> so goodbye so, uh, everyone. I'll see you next week. <laughs> nice. Thanks, Olivia. Have Appreciate great it. Week. Bye. Bye. But by the way, did, did all of you see the South Park episodes with Cthulhu in it? It came out no. a few years ago. I thought there was just one. There was there was a trilogy. Oh no, I, I did no. not know that. No. I'll have to, because I think South Park is on Netflix. No, I never I never was interested in South Park. Oh, it can, well, it can I, be I didn't. Know, I, don't, I I watch it occasionally when and when they get it right, they get it right, and this one they. They used 
Cthulhu to explain why Kenny keeps coming back from the dead, which I thought was phenomenal. <laughs> oh. Didn't, didn't, don't, just, I could never see South Park. The Venture Rick's Brothers, I thought. Right, it's pretty funny. Oh. Well, on September 7th, um, John Joseph Adams is going to be on the show. Um, oh, cool. Sorry? Cool. He's, uh, he's the editor of Lightspeed Magazine and I think a couple of other magazines. Um... Seems like a really nice guy, a real talented guy. So uh, I haven't lined up as many guests lately because I've been so busy, and I get a lot of people saying that they love these type of shows where we don't have a guest. So I may flip it every other Sunday. But anyway, he's going to be on the show, and that, that'll be that'll be a fun show. Do you guys know him? I know of him. Okay. And everything I've ever heard about him is glowing. Yeah. Yeah, he's got a lot going on. So, anyway, thanks, guys. I'm going to go eat supper. Thanks for watching. And okay. Thanks, to you guys thanks for Mike. Thanks for having me. Good everybody. We'll all see right. you later. See you guys next weekend. See you all next week. See you guys. Take Bye. care.